I run development products at Oracle, and my Twitter email's there. We're going to talk about rad software development. Um, and we're going to contrast that with the way things typically are done or have been done. So a little bit about me. So my name is Chris, obviously. I joined Oracle in 98, so I've been here for a while. Uh, previous to that, I worked for a Microsoft ISV. And previous to that, I was actually an Oracle DBA running production systems with on-call pagers and all the fun that goes with 24-7 support. So at Oracle, I run a series of products. Their logos are down there at the bottom. Uh, these products are used by about 4 million people. So if we go kind of across the bottom there, we got our SQL development tool for developing against the database. That's the one that has the most. There's over 4 million people that use that. We have our modeling product, our RESTful product, and finally our command line. These together are in the top three downloads of all of Oracle. So when I joined Oracle, I thought it was a huge company. It was around 35,000. Now we're, uh, I believe, about 130,000. So for our team to stay in the top three, top five downloads for the entire company is pretty, pretty impressive. So since we're in Mexico, I thought I'd mention I play ice hockey. That's probably the polar opposite of everything here, right? The only ice I've seen this week is in my cup. So we're to talk about rapid application development, which is basically a development lifecycle designed to go faster with higher quality, more iterations to get through the development of a product quicker. So to understand why that's better, we have to talk about what the alternatives are. So you know, the alternative is the traditional waterfall approach, which is a sequential step. That's where the waterfall comes from. Uh, I've got a next slide that will tell us the other interpretations of waterfall. But you basically go through the entire process, right? From requirements to design, implementation, verification, maintenance. It's a very top-down driven approach. So for requirements, this is kind of a famous diagram. There's been many variations on that. I have a different variation. Maybe it's more appropriate for here in a second. But when you're going through the requirements phase, it's probably one of the most important phases, right? You have to talk to the business, find out what they want built, how they want it built, how the user interactions are going to work, what the flow of the application would be, any kind of hardware requirements, software requirements, what performance goals we have. If you're designing something that's routing network packets, routing low-level th stuff, obviously the performance is much more important. And then any interactions with other systems, other modules, other applications. It's very rare that something is built in isolation today. So I threw this in here as an example of what happens when requirements aren't gathered. Uh, I didn't realize there was so much gaming stuff here, so maybe it's even more appropriate for here. But if you look through the diagram, right, there in the upper left there, the customer explains it a certain way. So hopefully we've all played Super Mario Brothers. Maybe I'm dating myself too much here. Um, but then the various interpretations of that as it goes through the process. So what the customer wanted was a simple little tower. You jump over the bridge. What they end up with, uh, second to last one, is not even close, not even remotely close, right? So this is where the, that design, the requirements, did not go well, was not properly documented. And in the waterfall approach, you just stick with the design, you go to the next set of steps, and you design for that goal. So also in the design phase is where you establish what your architecture would be, that includes security, any extensibility, any modularity, any fault tolerance. So if you want a car that's souped up, this would be the where that, that phase would be. And then that's exactly what the expectation is. So that design sets up everything that follows. And any changes to that design typically uh, involve going all the way back, starting over, and going down the path again or doing things like change order requests, you know, hey, I didn't actually want 42-inch tires on a 40-inch tall car, and you have to do a design change or a change request to get back. 
Then it comes down to what we do, which is we code. So if the design documents are in place, it's supposed to be that the developers simply follow the design doc to the letter and build exactly what was built, designed. So that takes away a lot of creativity, right? So we're, we're all creative people. We like adding our own um, flavor to everything. Having something that simply follow the design, follow the goals, follow it verbatim, whether it be right or wrong, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, is kind of boring when it comes down to it. So then the next step would be the verification. So we had the design done, we had the code done, and then we have to verify it. So that means the developers would basically throw the code over a wall to a group called user acceptance testing or quality assurance, something like that. Um, if anything goes wrong there, again, it goes back into the cycle. This is a step today, we'll talk about it again, but this is a step today that's probably shortcutted a lot more than it should be. And the important thing here is, again, back to that design goal, the verification is against the original spec. If, say, the business changed, the flow changed, the customer changed, the interaction changed through the process, this verification goes back to that original design goal, and they're just verifying that that design goal was met. So now, if everything goes well, if you build your barrel correctly according to the specs, um, and take it over the waterfall in the US, I guess technically Canada, there's a famous waterfall called Niagara Falls. And years ago, they used to uh, build barrels or whatever and take them over the waterfall. This is the other interpretation of that waterfall uh, phrase. So you would build your design, have it all done up front, have it be very accurate. I need to jump over this cliff. Hopefully nothing changes, nothing, nothing interrupts what's gonna happen, and all goes well. Typically it doesn't, and it doesn't for a number of reasons, usually back to that design goal. So if you can clearly articulate with the business exactly what the designs are, exactly how it should be built, then things will go smooth. What this turns into is each one of those phases in that waterfall approach has very specialized people. So there's specialized people that are, understand the business and they document it, hopefully thoroughly. There's specialized people that understand the architecture and the coding and the verification in each one of these steps. So now to contrast this with rapid application development, we're not really skipping any of the steps but we're shrinking the cycles, and more of the people are more experts in different areas. So you can actually have myself as a developer sit down with the business and understand the business versus having someone dedicated to writing and understanding the business. And then you have faster cycles with them so that you can do, say, a two-week cycle or two-day cycle or something like that so that you can prototype it, have it seen, have it reviewed, and uh, make sure you're on track. The incremental approach allows usable systems to be built very, very quickly. Because if you can imagine sitting down on a two-week cycle out of a six-month window, every two weeks you're having a checkpoint with the end users that are going to be using this system. So it's very easy to stay on track. It's very easy to deal with changes as they come up and implement those. And then the other difference, I think it's obvious, is there's less upfront planning. So it might start with something on the back of a napkin, as simple as that. Something where you are sitting down with a business and you wanted to have an application that does X, and then it just grows from there. There isn't a detailed design of the business flow and business process up front. It kind of evolves itself as the application does. So what that means is exactly what we were saying. The requirements are done. We have frequent team in interactions. So Oracle, uh, if anyone hasn't heard, we have our own cloud. So the way the Oracle cloud is built is very much like this. So every 
four weeks, basically, every team has an opportunity to deploy new things to the cloud. So what happens is we have to iterate what we're doing. If it's going to span more than those four weeks, we have to plan for that. So maybe if it spans two of those sessions, we would break it into modular pieces so that they can be built incrementally to be deployed in those cycles. So we, we build, we do these deliveries every, every two weeks, every four weeks, and we lay them out into the cloud. And then there's many, many iterations from the design to the construction, right? So you meet with the business, we talk to them, we would go back and build something, we would review it with them again, get feedback, iterate it again, take it back to them, and there's a very iterative process until everyone's happy, and then at the very end, we would cut it over into a production system for a deployment. So now, I've been doing this for uh, a while. Our products are used by millions of people. This is just my findings. So typically what happens, I believe, at least for our team, is three, three times it happens. So the first time we make the products functional, we agree with the, whoever the end user is, what's going to happen there. We get the business flow correct, whether that be ordering something or compiling code, writing the compiler itself. The second iteration of this is usually where we speed it up. So the first time, you're not so concerned with speed, performance, things like that. The second time is where you start bringing the performance impact in. And then the third iteration is typically what, where we get with the production quality code that we're going to end up deploying. And the third time what happens is you integrate what you learned from step one, from step two to make it performant. The first time through, you may have taken some shortcuts. You may have not used best practices, but you still circle back and fix that later. Now, the part that gets skipped a lot these days is the testing. Thorough testing is what I mean. So we still have our quality control, user acceptance testing. The part that gets overlooked a lot is when developers are doing unit testing. A lot of companies, if you're building something, and you are given a six-month window, what happens is you use that full six months and estimate six months. A company will come along and say, hey, can you do it sooner? And then the impact in scheduling is that you cut out things like testing or cut them down. This, of course, leads to less quality, all those kinds of things. So if you push testing down into your rapid application development as well, it tightens the, uh, tightens the quality a lot. So the, the power of this is that changes can be introduced mid-cycle. So by not having a, a two-inch thick document that you have to adhere to, you can actually react to changes as they come along. So as the changes come in, you have another one of these cycles. You can integrate those changes and review them again. The feedback allows for less misunderstandings. Back to those tree, that tree diagram and that Mario Brothers, um, though each one of those steps wouldn't vary much from the original because what happens is as soon as it starts to deviate, one of these shorter cycles will bring it back in line with what's expected. And then the other thing is it allows us as developers um, to be more creative and have more control over what we're doing versus reading a document uh, and purely integrating that or implementing that document as is verbatim. So it allows us to think out of the box. It allows us to learn the business. So here, I think there's a lot of college students. So what this really means for that aspect is don't focus on only, say, a CS degree. Get some business classes in as well so that you can actually understand on the business side what happens, how the flows work. Um, it lets you get into that side as well. What I've learned is the person, the developer that can also understand the business is going to be very successful, much more successful than someone that just uh, codes to specs 
gets it done. Not that that person wouldn't be successful, but it gets you more exposure because then you're interacting with the business. You have an opportunity to interrogate the business and help change things. And then take that through to the application and actually build that. So again, we're, I think, mostly students here. So that far uh, pie circle is probably what a lot of school projects has taught people, right? So what happens in a group project in schools, at least my son tells me, my son's in high school, is there's always one person that does all the work, someone that like disappears and comes back to get all the glory, right? And then the people that promise the work and don't show up, don't get anything done, effectively don't trust anyone, right, when you're doing group projects. But using RAD development, it's all about communication collaboration. So anything that can be done to collaborate better only helps the project. That means from the users to the development, the testing, operations, the entire ecocosm of this project, the more you collaborate, the better. And the more variety of people you get in there. So not just the business, not just the developers, right? We do a great job of talking to our own. So we'll talk to the developers every day. But we have to go back and get the users in there. And we have to bring the operations people in there. Because maybe we built something that ultimately, when it's deployed, is operationally complicated more than it should be. Uh, the other thing, my opinion, that RAD development does is it produces a higher skilled developer. Because you are working on tighter schedules, you have to think about how the code has to be structured, how to make it more modular, how to make it all interop together. Again, versus the old way of doing it, which is I got a spec, it's two inches thick, I have to write 10,000 lines of code, and I'm done at the end of the day, right? So because you have to interact with the business more, because you have to collaborate with other groups more, it actually helps raise our skill sets as a whole. So now these are just some excuses I've heard from various people. So when they say they have to develop faster, they have to use Agile or RAD or any of these things, a lot of people say, well, we stopped documenting because we had to go faster. Because we're RAD, we don't have to document anymore. Right? So this is not an excuse for bad design. It's not an excuse for lack of documentation. It's not an excuse to actually skip any of those steps that were in the previous waterfall approach, right? So going back to that waterfall approach, everything is actually still done. It's just less formalized in the terms of documentation and people. It's everyone helps together to bring it all together. Uh, bad design, lack of documentation. So imagine that you write this code, you deploy this code, and you go off and do three other projects. You come back in six months, it's not going to go well, right? There's been many times where I've gone back and looked at my own code that I've written. Thankfully, I documented it. And I was thinking, what, did I, what was I thinking back then, right? You've learned a lot in that, in that time gap from moving from project to project. So you can bring that back next time that you have to do something. But if there's no documentation, if the code isn't well maintained, well formatted, all those things, right? It makes it that much harder. And definitely the last one here, um, if it compiles, ship it. I think it's a standing joke. I hope nobody does that. Um, meaning, basically, you skip all testing, and it compiles, you ship it straight out to the customer. I've heard there were some uh, fairly large internet companies, and what they would do is they would actually use their production as their test, not Oracle. Um, but what they would do is say they had a farm of machines that is, say, let's say 10 for argument, 10 machines. What they would do is they would have load balancing, you know, round robin, all 10 are in cycle. They would actually deploy their code to say two of them and see how it works, see how it goes. It's very easy to take those two back out of circulation and get, put the load back on the other eight. So that's a, one way that they were making sure that they didn't just ship it and hope for the best. All right, so another aspect of this is we talked about collaboration and how important collaborating is. So this is a fairly famous quote. Hopefully everyone learns this in, in school still. But any piece of software, if you look at it, look across, um, it basically represents 
the org structure of the company that's building it. What that means is if you look at how organizationally things are built, typically there's someone in charge, he has people that work for him, they have people that work for them. These people develop with a silo mindset. What happens here is you end up with layered types of things that actually don't lend themselves to rad development, more collaboration. So imagine in this example, we have the infrastructure team, we have the development team. If they never actually talked to each other, never collaborated on anything, what you're gonna end up with is a bunch of developers that write code, they think the code is great, they throw it over at the production guys, and the production guys have to support it. Hopefully it goes well. Typically what, or not typically, but what does happen occasionally is they send over something that's not good. It could be not good in terms of what the production team has to do. It could be not good in terms of the layout of the code, the modularity, the infrastructure that it was designed. But because of this, this paradigm, what hap that happens frequently. The alternative is, of course, everyone talks together, and you decentralize that, and you don't end up with these layered approaches. So centralized organizations lends itself back towards more of the waterfall approach, where you have a design document, that design is reviewed by the business, it's reviewed by the development, it's reviewed by operations, and then it comes all the way back with changes and you go through this whole cycle. That takes a long time. If you can imagine every time something needs to change, that many people have to review it and come back in formalized ways, it just takes time. So it takes a lot longer. And typically, what, these are more monolithic type applications. They're bigger applications, more moving parts, and they have to be delivered in a more methodical, larger way. Versus if you're doing rad development or more modular code, you can use things like microservices. Oracle has a few rad development frameworks. They're smaller things that play a bigger part in a, in a bigger, uh, bigger role. But what happens is each one of these smaller pieces are modularly themselves standalone, and then they end up talking together. So if you're building, say, an HR application, well, HR doesn't actually have to be tied to like a sales organization, or it doesn't have to be tied to um, a gamification type application, right? Each one can be built independently, they can be revved independently, and as long as those handshakes are consistent and documented, that's all that has to be done. So then each individual one can take a rad, agile approach and still play a part in a bigger role. And then the other thing with rad development, again, this is my impression, is rad development or these microservices, the developers actually uh, feel more of a sense of ownership. If I'm building a rad application and I'm working with the business and we're iterating back and forth, my sense of ownership of that application, my pride in that application is much higher than if I'm just following a document or if I'm building a tiny module in a bigger context of a giant application. Because then the ownership is really back to that hierarchy of people. It's really that guy sitting at the top that's on the hook for delivering the entire monolith, right? Versus these independent systems. So what happens is because I have a better sense of ownership, my quality is going to be better. I'm going to take more pride in what I'm doing. I'm going to worry more about what the performance looks like. If it's a graphical application, I'm going to take more pride in what it looks like, how the user interactions look, all those types of things. So if you take rad development and do the collaboration, the next phase or the next step of this is DevOps. So basically, it's just a continuation of the same concept. The only difference here is this is bringing ops and development talking together. So the big change for a lot of companies here is this is a culture change because it goes back to that hierarchy that existed. So that hierarchy has to turn and pivot and be less formalized, less structure. It means your development and your operations do talk to each other. They do interact on a rapid cycle to actually implement what they're doing. And then, again, back to collaboration. You can't collaborate enough 
with the entire organization. So the intersection of all these different groups together is what's being termed DevOps. And then the end result is a piece of software that can go end to end in the business from all the way through design, all the way through deployment, and everyone's had their input, everyone's collaborated, you can come out with the best thing you can. So in that DevOps definition, I think I got it from Wikipedia. So the main thing that was in there was culture. So the biggest thing is with the culture is changing the organization so that the entire organization has a common goal. My goal as a developer isn't to produce code, it's to help the business. The, de the system administrator's goal is not to keep the system running, it's to keep the business running. So ensuring everyone has the same goals across the entire organization, that leads to shared success, the entire business is better, hopefully that means everything is better. So then when you come to DevOps, uh, specifically they call out Agile, but Agile and RAD are pretty similar. Um, so basically it's a rapid iteration. So you're gonna rapidly iterate on that development cycle. And then you're gonna automate everything you can. So you're gonna automate the build processes, you're gonna automate the testing automation, you're gonna automate the deployment of it. Basically, what it comes down to is you're building cloud. And then the last piece of that is metrics. So we talked about ownership of the code. So today in a lot of environments, what happens is developers do not get access to production metrics, to systems that show how the business is doing overall. If I wrote an application, and if I have access to the production data, and it says that I'm running slow, again, back to that ownership, that pride, I'm gonna go and fix that, because I don't wanna have slow code out there. I don't want the end users to be operating on something that's less than optimal. And then the last thing is anything that enhances collaboration. That means instant messengers, wikis, right? Anything at all that auto helps with auto collaboration. So what this means in terms of development and operations getting together, uh, the picture down there is supposed to be funny because today in some environments, developers and operations are kind of oil and water. They don't get along because the developers sent something over, the DBAs, the database, the sysadmin guys applied it, it didn't work, it's a developer's fault, and they get in email wars, things like that. If we work together, these types of things don't happen anymore. That means in the development process, maybe the production operation support has something that implement, impacts how the development should be done. Maybe the layout of the systems, maybe as trivial as how the system is load, load is handled, how it's balanced. Maybe it doesn't have to be 24 seven, maybe it only has to be nine to five, right? All these types of things could come back. And then uh, metrics and monitoring I don't think I can say enough about that because the admins, the operations can tell you how good the system's running, how the performance is, what logs come out of the system so that you can get access to them to be able to go back to the development and fix that, hopefully in another one of these quick cycles and get it deployed again. So anyone that's written code has inevitably broken a build? Always happens. So. Uh, continuous build, continuous deployment, these are paramount in getting rapid application development going, getting agile going, DevOps. For example, in our team, what happens is every time a developer writes a piece of code, they check it into our system, the system every five minutes will actually do a full compile of the products. So within five minutes, a developer gets a nice email reminding them that they broke the build. What this does is it actually brings up our quality with a few exceptions here and there. Once in a blue moon, someone will check something in on Friday as they're running out the door, right? And then it's broken for the entire weekend. Uh, but in general, what happens is we check the code in, hopefully no emails come out. If the email comes out, we can react very quickly, we can get our source code to a consistent state to where we know it builds. The other thing that happens is uh, 
everything today. So again, my son's in high school. Instant gratification, right? Everything has to be right now or you lose interest. So if you checked a piece of code in on, say, Monday, and we only do builds on Sunday nights, you know, that's a big window of when things could have changed. Who knows? Someone else could have checked something in that conflicted with mine. Things could happen. So you get a, a, an almost instant, within five minutes, that knowledge that it happens. And then what we do internally as well is we can't realistically test a build of our code every five minutes. Our regression suites take uh, upwards of 150 hours, I think. I can't remember exactly. So obviously we can't build every, test every five minutes. So what we do is we produce an actual build artifact versus a continuous compile. So we, build, we produce that build artifact on a nightly basis, and then that goes through the automation for testing. So automation. Automation helps everything. And again, automated testing. Everything goes back to testing. Just because it compiles doesn't work. Uh, a lot of what happens, what I've seen today, is people do a lot of positive testing. So if I go into the HR system uh, and I give someone a raise, we'll test the positive case of that. What happens if someone makes a typo and puts in a zero or an empty or those types of things, right? Inevitably, the one constant is users will do not what you designed a system to do. So the great thing at a conference like this, right, is in the gaming world, those are called glitches, and they're cool. In a business world, they're not so cool anymore. Uh, automated testing, there's really no excuses other, other than if the business time constrains you, and you still got to do as much as you can. There's automated testing frameworks in pretty much every language that exists. The metrics, I said a lot about it, but uh, metrics, you can't go wrong with more metrics. The more you measure, the more you can react to those measurements and impact the code, impact what's happening. Um, developers can see what's slow. They can say where, see where something went wrong. They can see where users made mistakes in the business flow, in the application itself. So just because it worked in development does not mean it's going to work in production, right? So here's another common case. A developer builds an application on my laptop. My laptop's obviously not that big. I developed something with myself. I deployed it to something that has 10,000 users. Do you think I might have forgotten a performance thing or two here and there? Chances are I probably did. Maybe I have only uh, you know, 100 rows worth of data, 100 records in my data. And then in production, it turns into 100 million, right? Back to these metrics. The more access to the metrics, the more I can see that, the more I can take it back into these rad development cycles and get a fix out as quickly as possible. <laughs> and specifically in our world, there's this ELK stack. Uh, if you're in this DevOps world, you probably know what it is. If you're interested in it, you can just Google that ELK stack. It's very good at getting these metrics, these logs, this stuff back to, cus back to the end users. So now tying this all back, this was supposed to be rad for the cloud. So cloud, I don't know if anyone's seen this sticker. It's kind of funny, right? Cloud's just someone else's computer. So when you boil it down to it, maybe. But cloud is a lot more than just a remote computer. What happens in cloud, right, is we just built an application. We got it working with the with the business, we got it working with operations, we automated everything, and now we're gonna deploy it. So cloud, to me, everyone probably has their own definition, but cloud to me is consistent automation of everything in the application, right? So I wanna be able to automate from soup to nuts, deploying the system, creating, say, a virtual machine, installing my database, installing my middle tier logic, installing everything, soup to nuts. Doing that not on cloud uh, is very hard because what happens is your operations people have to buy a new machine. New machines don't show up on the doorstep because you wanted it today. Um, once that machine is done, they have to physically place it somewhere. They have to wire it together. They have to get the other machines together. On cloud, 
very easy, you can automate the entire flow. So then tying it all together, you have rad development, working with DevOps, you have complete automation, end-to-end -end automation. You can create and destroy entire environments. Another common thing that happens for developers is we don't get access to representative systems of what eventually gets placed into production. So by having everything fully automated and using cloud, you can actually spin up a new environment basically on a whim. So it's Tuesday afternoon. I need to have a new development environment because I need to test something. I need to automate something. Maybe in this rad cycle, a new uh, requirement got injected into the flow. I can actually spin that up, completely have an entire environment very quickly with cloud. All right. So then why am I here? So Oracle is a huge investment in Mexico data center. Not data, development center. It's over five years old. There's a brand new campus being built. Um, there's our Twitter handle there. Probably most importantly, right, is there's a drone giveaway. So there's a hashtag for that. I believe uh, the only requirements are you have to do some rad development. You have to use our application express or our Oracle Jet. These are two frameworks that lend themselves extremely well to rapid application development. Um, the major differences between the two is the JET is for REST-based access. So if you have a data store, something you need to just RESTfully access that data, you can do that. The Application Express is more geared towards if you have an Oracle database already. And if you're curious in more details on any of these, our booth is over in the other building Kind of about in the middle. You can't really miss it. There's a giant Oracle ball hanging up there. So I think that's it. So I think we do questions now. If anyone has any. Questions? Questions? <laughs> There's a microphone in that? Yeah, it's strange. <laughs> OK. Yeah, uh, my question is that you mentioned several times RAT and Agile. So what would be the main difference? Sorry, yeah, I, I didn't catch the beginning. What did you? Sorry, oh. the difference between RAT and Agile methodologies. Oh, the difference between yeah. RAT and Agile? Yeah. They're very, very similar when it comes down to it. Agile. Uh, um, Agile still has more documentations, more formality to it. Um, RAD is more iterative prototyping, if you will. So you're going to prototype something, and maybe the prototype is completely thrown away. Agile, Scrum, they're more about you establish what you want to accomplish in, say, a two-week cycle, and you do that. And then you do the next two-week cycle versus an iterative prototyping. That's the main difference. The, the philosophy is pretty close to the same. That's it? No one else? OK, thanks.